Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we have a contentious video for you. Truth versus happiness. Critical race theory and the decay of lying. Now, life asks death, why do people love me but hate you? Death responded, because I am a painful truth and you are a beautiful lie. Today we're going to look at an interesting argument against the teaching of the truth about the history of racial discrimination in a country. Specifically, it will examine the question of whether or not there are situations where we should teach children a pleasant lie over a painful truth. We're going to be bringing in arguments from both Oscar Wilde's Decay of Lying and Critical Race Theory, so if you haven't watched our series on the Decay of Lying or our video on Critical Race Theory, you may want to do that now. We will also explore the general question of whether it's better to believe pleasant lies, or hold out for the harsh truth. So, philosophers are often very focused on obtaining truth over all else. Aristotle is quoted as saying something that translates roughly to, truth is a better friend than Plato. This leads to arguments that actively promote falsehoods, often being dismissed out of hand. However, I think there's a real question to be asked of whether in some situations pleasant lies are better than painful truths. We come at this issue from two directions. First, from an objection to the teaching of critical race theory in public schools. Parents often object to the idea that their children are being made to feel ashamed they are white or ashamed they are American. With philosophical charity in mind, we might interpret this in two different ways. On one hand, we could interpret it as a denial of the fact that there continue to be systems that perpetuate racism in America. The empirical facts of this have been hashed out in other fora, and we're not going to cover them right now. We're actually going to set that claim aside. The other way to interpret this objection is an admission of the truth of such a claim, but an assertion that children should not be taught it even if it is true. In this video, we're going to take on the assumption of of, let's, let's say that these claims are true for argument's sake, and we're going to look at this second class of claims, that assuming even that they are true, that there are reasons we shouldn't teach them to children, that we should lie to children for the sake of their happiness, their self-worth, or even to help them combat racism in the future. So, the other direction we're approaching this work from is based on Oscar Wilde's Decay of Lying, which argues, among other things, that nature follows art instead of the other way around, and that we should paint the world that we want to exist instead of the world that it is. We should tell stories about a more beautiful world than actually exists, a more perfect world than actually exists. We shouldn't focus on realism. We should focus on the possibilities of what could exist. We should tell children about what is possible instead of the harsh truth. Now note that the argument here is making a stronger case than Wilde ever was, and so it is more inspired by Oscar Wilde's Decay of Lying as opposed to something that's contained within it. Wilde only proposed lies as a form of art and stories, while this claim is committed to them as a form of explicit education, which is a higher burden of proof to meet. Now, the underlying claim that we need to defend here is fairly simple. There are certain situations in which it is ethically permissible to tell children lies in order to educate them. If we're comfortable with that premise, we can move on to critical race theory being one such situation. For now, let's divide these kinds of lies into three categories. We'll look at the general case for them first, and then we'll look at the specifics of critical race theory. These are going to be simplicity lies, behavioral lies, and aspirational lies. We will describe each category, and then we'll examine the case for whether or not each is ethically permissible in the case of critical race theory. Note that when we're saying lie here, we mean telling a child something that you believe is not true, not merely making a statement that unbeknownst to you is false. And we're speaking of doing so in the context of education, not play, storytelling, or joking. Now, the first kind of lie that may be morally permissible is the simplicity lie. Sometimes, in order to understand something that's very complex, you must be first be told a simpler lie. Kids learn that the whole numbers are all that there exists before they learn about negative numbers, decimal numbers, imaginary numbers, because teaching them everything at all at once would be too much. Kids learn the common sounds that letters make, A makes A, ah, and the rules of English before learning that, in some cases, those letters actually make completely different sounds, and there are situations where those rules are broken. Read the poem The Chaos for some fantastic examples. 
Even adults learn simplified versions of scientific theories when they read them in the news, or use simplified models of situations where only a certain level of accuracy is required. See the different models of an electron that a chemist and electrical engineer and a nuclear physicist use. It's not that we're necessarily teaching those people lies, it's that a simplified version is all that's required for the work that they're doing. If any lies are permissible, it seems like simplicity lies are the best candidates from a practical standpoint. Few people think that we should be giving kindergartners issues of academic journals to teach them science. You need to start somewhere, and often that place is a lie, even if it's only a lie of omission, to get to the truth. Lies of simplicity are temporary, inherently, and they are still in the overall pursuit of truth. So I'd expect that most would advocate that advocate for truth would accept them as morally permissible, at least in some cases. Though, in the specific case of critical race theory, we'll see. The second kind of lie we will call behavioral. This is the elf on the shelf lie, the Santa is making a list and checking it twice lie. You want to teach your child to behave ethically, but below a certain age, they struggle to have intrinsic motivation, motivation coming from themselves, to behave that way. So you invent an extrinsic motivator, someone that is always watching them to get them to behave. The permissibility of these lies is mm, up for debate. Some argue that they are necessary for teaching children to follow ethical rules when you're not around, by making them feel as if they are always being watched. See ben Bentham's Panopticon for more. We just had a video on that quite recently. Others argue that these only lead to kids having extrinsic motivation to be good. And when they find out that these were lies, they are more likely to misbehave and can be harder to instill intrinsic motivation for good behavior because the only reason they were doing it was because the elf on the shelf is watching. If the elf on the shelf isn't real, then there's no reason for them to behave. All of this to say the behavioral lies are disputed in terms of their ethical mandate. Remember that our definition of lies here covers things that adults believe to be false, but tell kids anyway. So using religion to convince kids to behave doesn't count here. For example, Jesus is watching you, so long as the parents honestly believe in it. Whether or not that religion is true is beside the point here, though there are clear parallels between Santa and Jesus. And we will cover these kinds of falsehoods, falsehoods or lies where the adults honestly believe them themselves, but may simply be ignoring the inconsistencies because it makes them happy, not just for their children's happiness, more at the end of the video. Finally, aspirational lies are those that you tell your child in the hopes that they will embody them and then live up to them. If you tell a kid that they are kind, they may take that on as part of their identity and work to be kind moving forward, even if they were not that kind to start with. Confidence is a key part of performance. Conversely, we can empirically see evidence of the opposite effect. When you tell children that they are bad, instead of saying that their actions are bad, they can, and sometimes do, internalize that identity as a bad person, harming their self-worth or shaming them. Communities identify certain values that they have of loyalty, honesty, respect, etc., not because they have great empirical evidence that their community exemplifies those values more than the community next door, but rather because these are aspirational values. If you tell a child that our community believes in loyalty above all else, it's not because you have statistics showing that your community is more loyal than the community next door, but rather because that is something that is aspirational, that by telling that child that, you're hoping that child will internalize that value, not because of a rational argument that loyalty is good, but rather from a sense of identity identity. The child identifies as being part of that community and therefore identifies with that particular value. And so when we're teaching kids about certain values, we want to be telling them these stories of how the community values these things, even if those factual stories of how the community is exercising those values aren't necessarily true. Aspirational lies can be very consequentialist in their justification. We tell children that we as a community are good people because we hope that we'll, that will make them good people too. A little ethical harm here to have a big ethical payoff later when those children grow up to identify deeply with being good people. Conversely, one might be concerned that if such protestations of values are too at odds with the factual history of that community, then children might internalize the wrong message. They might believe that, oh, our community is good people, and so we care about being moral, and our history shows that we've done all of these horrible things. So instead of 
saying, oh, I shouldn't do those horrible things, the child may say, wait, our community was always moral. So actually, those horrible atrocities were good because they're justifying that as saying our community has these deep values of morality, of being ethical, of being just. We did all of these horrible things. Those things, eh, maybe they're not actually that horrible because our community did it. It's this kind of uh, reverse uh, Scotsman fallacy uh, that we run into. Now, Turning to critical race theory, what are the claims that proponents of critical race theory claim are true, but opponents claim should not be taught to kids? These include things like our country is and has always been fair and just, our demographic community, what have you, race, religion, region of the country, etc., has a history of doing the right thing and doing good in the world, the wars that our country or community fought were fought for a just cause, and our ancestors died for a good and just reason. Note that these are an issue only when these are lies, and not isolated to the U.S. Examples include many groups that committed or were fighting for the preservation of atrocities, the Nazis, the Soviet Union, the American Confederacy, the Ottoman Empire, etc. People do not like to admit that their ancestors were bad people, that certainly that their ancestors died in service of a horrible negative cause, or that their nation was built on atrocities. The Turkish government argues that the Armenian genocide never happened and continues to do so to this day. Neo-Nazis deny the Holocaust. Putin and the Russian government deny the Holodomor and many Southern Americans denied that the U.S. Civil War had anything to do with slavery. Because these are painful truths. We don't want to admit the facts that maybe our ancestors did bad things and didn't just do bad things, sacrifice their life in service of bad things. As before, we're not looking at the truth of these claims. Rather, we're assuming that things like the Holocaust actually happened, but instead asking the question of, even if these things were true, should we be teaching kids about it? Should we lie to our children about these things? Should we tell kids that their grandfathers and grandmothers were villains that they should hate? Should we tell them that their country's values were ignored by its leaders? That its systems actually failed to stop the atrocities? That people of their race or religion used their identity to justify harms for others? That the benefits that they have, their family's wealth, position, land, or privilege, were actually stolen from others on the basis of unethical ideas of racial hierarchy? If children are not responsible for the sins of their fathers, should they still be forced to learn about those atrocities? That's the question here. Now that we understand what the lies are that we're expecting to teach, let's look at some possible justifications. So first is the case for simplicity. Basically, that these concepts are too complicated for kids to understand. Ethics is a complicated subject. The amount of moral responsibility that children should bear for the sins of their parents, grandparents, community, or country is complicated to understand, particularly when those kids are able to inherit things like wealth, land, privilege, title, etc. from those parents, grandparents, and so on. It can be emotionally hard for children that lack the cognitive facilities to grapple with complicated questions of whether or not they should feel guilty for having privilege. They may not be able to understand the nuances of a system that in some cases is fair, but in other cases is not. It's hard to understand the narrative that progress has been made in addressing some of these inequalities, but that progress is not finished and hasn't been completed. Some of these issues may be too complicated for kids to understand and may leave them feeling resentful of their own identities, of their families, and guilty, or their communities, their countries, and guilty for things that they didn't do. However, one might respond that while we may have a desire to simplify the content or gloss over it, we shouldn't lie about it, as lies can cause harm as well. Telling kids from less privileged backgrounds that their lack of privilege has nothing to do with historical racism or oppression is also harmful. Additionally, there's a case that philosophical concepts like ethics should be taught sooner. It's not that children lack the cognitive facilities to engage with complicated ethical topics, but rather that they haven't been taught the frameworks and philosophical background yet. Young kids can't read academic journals because they lack the background understanding to make sense of them. Kids struggle with these ethical thorny issues because they have never been taught ethics. Teaching ethics, morality, and theories of justice to younger children would give them the tools to engage with these tough concepts. The answer is not to avoid these concepts, but rather to give kids a philosophical education so that they can understand the arguments about these ethical issues, process them better, and understand whether or not they should feel guilty, what they should do about privilege and inequality and justice. 
Now, instead of simplicity, we might argue that we should lie to children about how moral their country or their forefathers were to make them behave. If children believe that their communities do not follow the law or oppress other groups to get ahead, and that with enough power, these laws don't matter, they're more likely to try to break these laws. Laws have power because we all agree to abide by them. When we're teaching children about this social contract, if we teach them about all the times those laws were broken without consequence, especially by people from their communities, they may not actually accept the importance of the rule of law, leading to further lawlessness and eventually greater harm. Focusing children on the stories where the law succeeds, especially when they're younger, and still formulating an understanding of right and wrong may help them to behave better and eventually become more moral adults. Faith in the justice system can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you believe that the system is work, you're less likely to commit a crime because you believe that if I commit this crime, I will be arrested, I will go to prison. You're less likely to resist arrest because you have faith that the officer isn't going to assault you or beat you or plant evidence on you, etc. And therefore, because you don't resist arrest, you are less likely to get in a situation where you are actually being beaten by that officer. If you think, however, that the system is inherently flawed, you're less likely to obey it and more likely to commit a crime and resist arrest because you think the system is broken. We might tell children lies about just how our systems are because we want them to follow the laws to keep them safe, even when we think those laws and systems are themselves unjust. We want to start children off on that basis point of thinking that the system's going to work so that they actually follow the system. One might respond that children who are taught that the system always works are more likely to snap and completely throw all faith in the law out when they learn the truth. They're more likely to become disillusioned if they learn they were lied to than if they understand that the system was a work in progress all along. You don't have to teach them that everything is flawed and broken and corrupt in order to give them an honest re representation of how the system works. You can say that, well, it doesn't always work, but it sometimes does. It's a work in progress. We're trying to make it happen. And we're striving towards justice. We're striving towards these things. We're idealizing that. If you understand the law as a collective project of trying to make a more just world that's imperfect, you may be more likely to try to strengthen it and uphold that system. You might be less like to support it if you think it's perfect unbreakable and then later realize that it was rotten from the beginning. You might go too far and think that everything's broken, everything's corrupt, when in fact, a lot of things are working well, but there are still a lot of problems. It's an empirical question that can be studied, whether people are more likely to support a system that they always knew was flawed, but striving, than a system that was claimed to be perfect, but they later discovered was in fact far from it. But it's at least possible, plausible, that some will become more moral for having been told the truth all along that you will need to fight for justice, and you may not always get it. Perhaps the strongest argument for lying to children about history and the law is aspirational. Wilde argues that life follows art, not the other way around. History is more factual than art, but it is still in many ways a story that we tell ourselves about who we are and what our values are. Instilling values is about more than just telling children that justice or equality matter. It's about telling stories and history where people valued justice and where justice won out. It's giving children idols who, in, who embody those values and seeing those idols win in a process of history, seeing them succeed, seeing them honored and championed. Proponents of teaching critical race theory often critique the fact that when we tell the history of racism in America, we focus on the abolition of slavery and the civil rights movement, but ignore the intervening years where there was substantial backlash against racial progress, the Tulsa race massacre that destroyed Black Wall Street, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, the rewriting of history by the Daughters of the Confederacy, the raising of monuments celebrating slavery and the Confederacy decades after the end of the war. However, one might argue that this is purposeful that we first need to teach children the good stories about what justice should look like so that they can inspire to it before we teach them the bad and the harm. We want to teach sto kids stories about when the good guys win so that they know what to aspire to and can identify with that and can build that sense of identity and culture and shared values before we teach them that the bad guys sometimes win too. At least we demoralize them and sap them of their desire to make the world a better place. To try to make progress, you must think it's possible. You need to think that this is a country where we can make progress, we can move forward. If all you see is the harm, then you're less likely to try to be someone that is fighting against racism today. 
While this is an interesting argument, there are arguably some flaws. Telling only the stories with a positive resolution risks endangering complacency, or engendering complacency, as children may come to believe that racism has been completely abolished, because the only stories they're told are the positive ones. Additionally, one can tell children the truth about racist backlashes without it leading to complete disaffection, by framing things in terms of a continuing fight, in terms of a long moral arc of the universe having bumps, but bending towards justice. We can tell the story of, we have come so far, but we have so far to go, as a story that's filled with hope for the future instead of blame for the past. The underlying danger that children will feel ashamed for being American or ashamed for being white has less to do with what you teach and more to do with how you teach it. You can talk about continuing systems of inequality while spotlighting the people that are fighting hard against those inequalities instead of the people that put them into place in the first place. You can focus on pride towards those who are doing good and embodying the values of America, even during times of backlash, instead of the people who betrayed those values. You can call out those people who betrayed those American values of justice and equality as being un-American as individuals themselves, not as a system. We can be aspirational while still teaching the truth. We can think of patriotism. This, this relates a little bit to a, a series we did a while ago on different types of patriotism. We can think of patriotism as ethical patriotism, the idea that you should be as a member of a society, it's not that you are necessarily, everyone in that society is embodying the values of that society, but rather you are working to make your society a better place. You are working to make your society something that enacts those values and ensures those values are put into reality. It's not that simply by being part of this society you magically take on those values, but as being a part of a society, you are part of a collective project of ensuring that your community, your country, your family lives up to those values. Now, a quick side note. This is not to say at all that there are not bad ways to teach a history of racism that can honestly make kids with privilege feel shame and guilt. It is not to say that there aren't ways that you can teach the truth that lead to disillusionment and self-hatred. Rather, this is to say that the outcome is not dependent on whether or not you're teaching the facts, but rather the way that you frame those facts as a continuing project of a nation that can stumble but is moving in a positive direction, or as a country that's inherently flawed, which we should be ashamed for having been born in. It should be clear that any facts can be taught harmfully. The case we're making here, or at least that these objections are making, is that it's possible to teach these facts positively and truthfully. We don't have to give up on truth to include a positive message and a positive framing that doesn't lead to kids being either disillusioned or feeling shame or self-hatred, but actually leads to kids further identifying with their country as a place or their community as a place that focuses on and cares about working to make themselves better, even if we're not there yet. Now, so far, we've covered the idea of a situation where we might teach children one thing, but when they make it to high school or college, reveal the truth. However, there is a concern that the opponent of CRT is actually trying to teach lies to children in the hopes that they'll never be taught the truth. In the desire to rewrite history to make themselves look better, the Daughters of the Confederacy wrote lies into textbooks not with the intention of telling children the truth in the future, but with a goal of changing our collective memory of the past. It seems to me the strongest objection to teaching children lies is that this may lead to them never being told the truth. If we don't teach the truth until you get to grad school, very few people get to grad school. And if we're just teaching most people lies, those will become the reality. They will become the history, because that's how we create history collectively and in our memories is from what we teach and pass down. And so if we're justifying lies to only a young group of kids, but we never end up telling people the truth, or people believe those lies so strongly that eventually when we tell them the truth, they dismiss it as, oh, that can't be true because this is what I was taught in school, we have a problem. And so you have this danger of lies being possibly perpetuated forever, even if our initial justification was only for doing them temporarily. Going further, this raises a concern that the quote from the beginning of the video raises. It seems that there are some people who would rather live a pleasant lie than accept a harsh truth, who ignore inconsistencies in their viewpoint, make up facts to suit what they want to be true, and ignore facts that make them uncomfortable. There are others that would rather believe something that is true, even if it's painful, who are willing to change their viewpoints based on new evidence. This is often a dividing line between religion and science, where religious people are more likely to accept claims that have no proof and don't make sense, but 
make them happy, such as that they will see their loved ones in a magical afterlife and live forever in bliss. While scientists are trained to change their beliefs based on experiment and empirical evidence, even if those new beliefs make them uncomfortable. Though, whether or not there's a rational way to decide to discard beliefs when you come up with a piece of evidence that disagrees with your web of beliefs and is, you're able to do that in a rational way is up for debate. Check out our series on underdetermination for more. But at least within science, there is that goal of being able to sort out and pull out beliefs that don't work anymore. A quote about life and death is often made with science and religion, where science is a painful truth and religion is a pleasant lie. Even certain news networks prioritize making their viewers happy instead of reporting facts. Fox News is known for emphasizing the importance of, quote, respecting their viewers, by which it means not presenting them with any information that conflicts with their existing worldviews, i.e. makes them unhappy, a policy that cost them close to $800 million this year. This leads to the underlying question of this video. Should we believe lies that make us happy? How does truth feature into an ethical mandate to make people happy? happy. Do we live better lives when we believe pleasant lies, like the claim that we have completely solved racism or that evil people will get punished when they die? Why should we focus on the truth when lies can make us so much happier? If the goal of life is to live a good life, and part of living a good life is being a happy person, why should we choose a path of truth that is inevitably making us unhappy, as opposed to these lovely pleasant lies that are lying around, they're a dime a dozen being sold on the corner of the street, that would make us happy, even if they're a little inconsistent, they don't really make sense, and they can't be backed up with any evidence. Why not choose the lies that make you happy? Well, the problem with pleasant lies is not how they make you feel, but how they make you treat others. There is only one truth, but there are many different pleasant lies. If you believe a lie that makes you happy, you will inevitably be in conflict with those that believe the truth, or those that believe different pleasant lies. This is not that much of a problem if you're sitting in your house not interacting with anyone, but it appears particularly where people need to make collective decisions. This happens in families, and it happens in politics. This lie that is pleasant to you isn't harming anyone until you try to impose it on your own children, who maybe value the truth more than a pleasant lie, or who might be made unhappy by that lie. You might vote for a politician that share your belief in that lie, but base, are basing policy on lies is ineffective at best and leads to deep divisions at worst. This compounds with the problem that people who are settled into these pleasant lies start to believe that everyone else around them is simply accepting other different pleasant lies. And so there's no more justification, there's no truth underlying this, but rather, oh, you're just in a different camp, you're on the other side, you must be believing a pleasant lie that makes you happy, I'm believing a pleasant lie that makes me happy, you're no better than me, and so there's this level of both sidesing and equivocating between these two positions where one group may actually be seeking truth while the other group is just seeking what will make them happy. In contrast, there's only one harsh truth. The case for choosing truth over pleasant lies is that truth and rationality allow you to settle disagreements without violence. They allow you to realize when you are wrong and change. They give everyone a single starting point instead of many different lies that make them happy. This is a similar conflict to the conflict between rationality and faith. Disagreement over faith and pleasant lies can only be settled through violence, but disagreements over rationality and truth can be settled with argument and empirical evidence. Whether it's blind religious faith in some claim that makes you happy, or the desire to believe that your ancestors didn't die defending slavery, a focus on pleasant lies is harmful because it inevitably undermines happiness in the long run by leading people into conflict with one another. The happiness supposedly provided by these lies is a pipe dream. This is an important point, because as a skeptic, I don't know if there's a truth out there. I don't know what that truth is. but I'm at least trying. I'm at least looking for it. A key part of my version of skepticism is striving for looking for truth and striving to find something that is true. The idea of simply giving up and accepting whatever pleasant lie is lying around is problematic because it can it has this illusion of it will bring you temporary happiness on some of these questions, but it can create so much harm in the long run because of your interactions with others and your interactions with a, a government or any kind of social choice system or a family. But I don't know if that's a better way to be or not. What do you think? Are pleasant lies better than harsh truths? Should we teach kids the truth about racism or give them some pleasant lies to start with? Will teaching a pleasant lie now lead to them ignoring the harsh truth in the future? 
Whew, that was a long one, a contentious one. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Watch this video and more here at Carneades.org. If you liked the video, please uh, like, comment, subscribe, do all the things, support us on Patreon, and stay skeptical, everybody.